listeners to attention. But the editorial procedure is such that everything pivots around the reading text, justifying it as reliable and authoritative and annotating specific passages so that we can track Poe's intentions, conscious as well as non-conscious. But the fact is that Pym has multiple narratives. Uh, and while Poe's intentions, conscious or otherwise, are invested in many of these narratives, all are social texts brought into being, that is, into the events that generate their meanings by multiple agents involved in the work's production and reception histories. A critical edition, like Pollen's, acknowledges the presence of those many agents and narratives, but it also works to organize them in a stable hierarchy of relations. In doing that, it seriously distorts our access to a comprehensive view of this discourse field, a distortion, ironically enough, that actually moves against the inertia toward social textuality that Poe worked so hard all his life and so successfully to gain. When McGill tracks some of those moves by Poe and by others, she says they, this is her, chart a progress toward the embattled center of the struggle over a national literature. It's exactly right. In fact, it is precisely the kind of center that Poe explicates in Eureka. It's a field of relations, I'm quoting Eureka, of which the center is everywhere and the circumference nowhere. That kind of field is much less a psychological space of personal expression than a social space of dialogue and dispute. Poe's individual work is exemplary because more than anyone else in that period, his writings regularly and deliberately make a spectacle of their social relations. The Longfellow War, the witty theatrics of the Valdemar case, the entire record of Poe's multiple publications and subsequent republications and reprintings. Through these events, we observe Poe's demonstrative explication and interpretation of the social dynamics of his world and the people who live in it. The work holds a mirror up to that world. The spectacle is framed, at least initially, by something Poe writes and then circulates. Once put in circulation, however, the writing gets seized and reframed by others, eventualities with which Poe may or may not engage, again, to give further definition to the complexity of the scene. More than most, Poe's writings d demonstrate why a throw of the dice, dice can never abolish chance. Indeed, each throw of the dice only proves the authority of chance. As Whitman's famous dream of Poe would reveal, Poe is a stormy, turbulent, and Poe's is a stormy, turbulent, and dislocated world. Few historians have ever seen the period otherwise. Antebellum America is a virtual byword for a society torn by illusions, conflicts, and extreme violence of many kinds. Poe's first book, Tamerlane and Other Poems, 1827, was published just before Jackson's first presidential term and the period of Jackson's administrations fairly defines the extreme dislocations that made such a fearful turmoil of antebellum America. Coming after Poe, Whitman would famously respond to that dark historic page by trying to see the American world otherwise, by imagining it, representing it as healthful and harmonious, or rather, as Democratic Vistas shows, as a tormented world dreaming toward health and harmony. But as is clear from the pivotal role Whitman gives to Poe in Out of the Cradle Endlessly Rocking, the whole poem pivots on a quotation from The Raven, Whitman's dream of America had first to pass through the straight gate of his dream of Poe. A great reward awaits the scholar who will also pass through that gate. I have been sketching the volatile character of the discourse field of antebellum America in order to emphasize the significant scholarly and critical opportunity this period holds out for us. Digital environments offer the means for constructing editorial machines that can usefully sit, uh, simulate the complex hyperworld that Poe's work exposes. Fear and illusion are the watchwords of antebellum America, as Poe more than anyone realized, because its high and conflicted energies were only barely held in control and often went altogether out of control, as we know from the Great Civil War. The Panic of 1837 is a virtual index of the chaotic energies that were ripping through antebellum America. Poe's comic parodies of enlightenment, like his quest for a poesie pure, are inverted expressions of the signs of the time, the reign of fear and illusion. Scholars 
have been pursuing machines for editing discourse fields of that kind for some time, the earliest being efforts to design and build different kinds of hypermedia environments. While these are often impressive projects, the Whitman Archive, for example, or the Electronic uh, Enlightenment, we are now beginning to see the serious limitations of their author-centered or thematic approaches. We want more than the comprehensive textual environments precisely because literary work and literary works are only weakly understood if they are understood as self-centered and self-identical. Some recent digital work that explore integrating timelines, geospatial information, and social software have been provocative. For example, Todd Presner's Hypercities project. Even more interesting is Timothy Powell's adventurous Jiba Gadina Magoon, an Ojibwe digital archive, right here in Philadelphia, by the way. Uh, this work is an attempt to construct an online design for a set of cultural materials that do not map to Western Enlightenment design models. More pertinent to the present discussion, the Ojibwe materials create a special problem for the study of American culture and history. Because Ojibwe history is conceived and organized along a sacred landscape, Ojibwe identities, objects, agents, actions, and even locations are radically discontinuous from the cultural formations that shape the logic of our Western and American databases and metadata ontologies. The structural and interpretive demands uh, and consequences of this situation are significant, as Powell's description of his project shows. I'm quoting uh, his description from an online uh, source. The metadata scheme of the database structure we've created inscribes a sacred landscape which allows Animiki'i and other Oshkabawisabag, or messengers, those are uh, Ojibwe words for messengers, to move uh, freely between the realm of the ancestors and this world. In doing so, we offer a spatiotemporal paradigm that if acknowledged by Americanists, would perhaps allow us to free ourselves of the deeply problematic concept of periodization and our seemingly endless obsession with nationalism, post-nationalism, transnationalism. It is sacred landscape that is distinctly Ojibwe, yet still part of American literary history. 